concentrated on me doing stuff as if that could show the creative process, which it can't. So instead, concentrating on just showing the flow of information, it's actually almost a kind of debris that goes through your studio and also through your head. forced room and I did it in 1982 specifically for the Guild Inn and for this site. When I came out here I wasn't sure exactly what my idea was but I'd been al I already had been working with lattice and I'd been working with architecture and when I actually came out to view the site there was a wonderful patch of ferns and so it came to me that what I really wanted to do was build a structure that looked like it was floating being held up by nature. It's a seven-foot cube, and there's two openings, the balcony window and the door. But the, the ceiling was purposely left open as a viewing, as a way of framing nature in a um, looking up into it. And the floor is also lattice, so that there's a, a, a greater sense of the fragility between the self and nature. There is an interface, but it's one that's perforated. The fact that it is actually partially open and partially closed makes it very much like a membrane between the self and nature. The body was really important as, the, um, as what completes the piece. But the body plays an important role. It's actually the, the calibration for all my work. This piece is actually quite a surprise to me because when I built it, I had no idea that it was going to be, uh, in some sense, a permanent piece. Up until that time, I was essentially doing very, very temporary installations or working with quite uh, temporary materials. I feel like I've lost the connection to the origins of, of possible Greek architecture, and these are only some way of recalling the origins. And it's not a definitive representation, but somehow a recollection or a recalling of what, what might have happened, and what might have become. Basically, these horns are from an abattoir, and um, what they're doing essentially is um, substituting for the um, actually the volute of an ionic capital. Now uh, the horn itself is in a, a volute-like configuration and it'll essentially be going on the capital similarly to this only the volute will be removed and so what I'm basically doing is substituting the stylized volute for an animal horn because of the way it, it curls, its scale. Also, sheep were sacrificed fairly regularly, 
within the Greek tradition. So I can essentially recreate the origin of the volute, which was based on a pagan ritual, um, based on animal and human sacrifice. To choose a horn like this is quite significant because at one point they used to hang the horns in the trees after the animals were sacrificed. The tree columns are really based on the sacrificial grove. And the sacrificial grove inevitably became the temples where the rituals moved to and where the sacrifices started happening. So the grove is the prototype for the temple. And again, the temple being an architectural structure is derived from the tree column and its, its function with the first sacrifices, the first pagan rituals. When I'm working really hard on something, it, it's like being, it's, you're just inside of it. And part of it is uh, getting it into the space or getting up, getting it up onto a wall. But not just even in the studio wall. It's not, not even really finished when it's on the studio wall, but when it's in, in a public space, mm -hmm. when it's moved out of the studio. And even that process of installing a piece for the first time is part of the creative aspect. If I have the commitment to start the piece in the first place, I've got the commitment to see it all the way through. Now, later on, you might then say, that was a hard piece to do, and I don't know if it was worth it, I don't really like it, but I've gone through the whole process. I usually don't give up halfway through something. Then it's not a matter of not being committed to the piece, in fact, it's the reverse by the fact that you're committed, then you proceed. I just feel very fortunate being here now, which allows me to do what I do, because I, I really like working with steel, and I like working with the scale that I work. But, um, I'm a person who responds very much to the world that I'm in, so that I, re I respond to the body, and I respond to architecture, and then I respond once again to the cultural context that I'm in. have the dark still in place is because I didn't have enough time to evolve the claw because it was originally called the egg and claw and the dart is a stylization like if you can imagine the dart being like that um, it also could look very much like a claw that means going out and getting chicken feet and casting chicken feet and putting and then determining where the chicken's claw would go, whether it would go under the egg, which I think would be nice because it would like hold the egg, or whether it would go where the dart is. It just was, it's another evolution, and I think that that work will still evolve and become more intricate and more specific about its references. 
but at this point in time, just to embed the egg in the molding seemed quite enough to establish that origin, the concept of the origin of the egg, egg and dart molding. My work is basically about going back to the very origins of how things evolve. For me, it's very critical to reintroduce the origins of how things began. With uh, the project at, at um, Mackenzie Hall in the courthouse, the column base is scagliola. It is a uh, imitation marbleizing effect, which I hope to introduce in more of my work in the future. Uh, I remember reading this thing in Bachelard where it was the first time that it seemed I. I had heard anybody say something positive about f housework because he talked about when you polish a surface how you're practicing the phenomenology of being by bringing the object, the table, the tray back into being. So it does connect with um, my imagery which actually has this uh, the idea of the body throughout every work but it's been uh, gotten into the work, into the sculpture in different ways. And one way was by doing work myself, that is, using my own body to make a history, for instance, as you say, on the surface of an object. But I don't feel that, that I have to do that anymore. To me, it's not a necessary way of giving value to a work. And I do some of the work and I fa have it sent out and some of it's fabricated and I don't have any feeling that somehow I must do every step or that the labor can't be divided. The column is based on the human body. The body in a column is actually based on a bound body in human sacrifice. I like plaster as a material because it's very malleable. It heats up. It almost feels like yeast or bread dough. And it has a kind of, it's kind of like a living matter. I tend to think of myself as a person who makes work in situ, in other words, does work directly on location. I simply create work in an architectural circumstance and I work directly with um, um, architectural components. It's for me like having a dialogue with a structure and giving a human presence or a hum the human presence of form to an architectural interior. that I do is very, very precise. Now, because I'm working in steel, I have to be very sure of the form before I send it to a fabricator. At a certain point, I blow up the drawing full scale in paper to work on the pattern. It's a very visual investigation of the form so that uh, by the time I send a pattern to the fabricator, I wouldn't want to make changes. But because my artwork usually involves more than one element, there is always room for still working with the final piece because I can add an element or I can change an element or I can space them differently. So the piece is never really finished, and my involvement is never finished in it until it's installed. And even the act of installing is a very creative act.
I wouldn't focus my energy on other things in the same way, with the same passion. I mean, if somebody broke down my activity in a rational way, that I move plaster around with my hands, it would seem very ridiculous. But for me, I've made it into everything. And somehow, because it's in my vehicle in the world, I've created its own legitimacy through my own belief in it. One or two shapes, one or two colors, one or two materials. So there's this kind of, at first, this sense of simplicity. But then as you look at it more, there's double weavings of double meanings and images and responses. So that, you know, I have to keep my brain in a place that isn't, that isn't purposely saying, this is about that because I, I don't want that kind of containment because actually I'm trying to work both inside and outside that boundary. It represents the body, but it doesn't represent the body in a specific way. I think that actually a lot of this imagery that I work with is effective after you're not in front of it anymore. And that might have something to do with where it comes from. Fleming and also Christopher Dudney have talked to me a great deal about the erotic content of my work. Actually, I, when I began my work, never realized that, that it had a, an erotic component. And it literally shocked me when I heard this. And then I've had to kind of re-examine my work. And because the work is about the human body, it naturally has the erotic and sensual side to it. A lot of the work that I've done over the years, there's a dialectic between inside and outside. And I think that's something that a lot of artists deal with. It's that relationship between internal and external experience and where the barrier is between those. It's, it's really a philosophical question about reality, about how you can figure out what you're seeing as opposed to what you think you're seeing. A lot of my work has been destroyed. One work that still exists is in an abandoned warehouse in London, Ontario. The reason it's, ex it's in existence, it's got a reprieve just because they have locked the doors and the whole destiny of the building is um, under speculation right now. All the work in situ basically has been destroyed. As I get older and the destruction of the work almost becomes a metaphor for my own personal destruction, well, I want to stop it and I want the work preserved. It seems very important to me to have the work um, exist, simply exist. Maybe I'll be one quarter of my way through a work, an interior work, and I, I, I'm I, working against myself, and then I start to really evolve some kind of internal rhythm. I think nothing of tearing down half a piece and redoing it. If I don't feel 
it's responding in the manner that I feel responds to that architectural condition, I'll just rip it down and then you rebuild. There are cases where I will absolutely defy what I had deliberately set out to do. And that is just an incredible uphill battle. And everything, all the forces are against me. You're best off to um, look and feel an internal correspondence. It's really you trust, you have to have faith in your own intuitive powers. self-conscious to, to do the kind of the true kind of deep play that I'm talking about. Yeah. It it just has to be like you have to forget. You have to forget everything. You forget who you are and what you know and what you expect and what other people expect. It's very hard to let go of all that stuff. Yeah. You know, just kind of course around. There is a lot of joy in making art. Uh, joy isn't the right word. I don't know how to describe it. It's a euphoric in a way because it's, um, it has a lot to do with free will. It's like being connected with your own mind in a really immediate way and um, not being self-conscious, having no and that's when the self-doubt disappe disappears and you're just under a real pure kind of investigation, like a, like a visual idea. So you're thinking it and feeling it through. I don't think I have a choice. For me, it's a necessity to make things. We have to have people that are thinking, and I think that's what art is. It's thinking. 